Hello, and welcome to this industry presented webinar, From High School to the Pros, Fueling Performance in the Age of Fast Food, Skipped Meals, and Convenience. A few housekeeping announcements before we get started. After viewing this presentation, you will have the opportunity to take a short survey where you can also post a question for the presenters and complete a 15 question self-test for your CEC. Upon successfully passing the self-test, you will receive a CEC certificate via email awarding your CEC and your CEC will automatically be added to your ACSM profile. Today's webinar is presented by Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Founded in 1985, the Gatorade Sports Science Institute is committed to helping athletes optimize their health and performance through research, education, and service in hydration and nutrition science. GSSI's primary objective is to study the effects of nutrition on the human body before, during, and after exercise and lead, enhance, and develop sports fuel innovations. For more than three decades, GSSI has worked with thousands of elite, professional, and amateur athletes to evaluate their fueling needs and provide recommendations to help improve their performance. GSSI collaborates with universities and researchers around the world to publish hundreds of peer-reviewed research papers. To help educate athletes, their influencers, and the sports science community, GSSI provides educational materials, research news, and various sports resources. For more information, please visit www.gssiweb.org. Today's webinar presenters are Khalil Lee and Kevin Lurz. Khalil is a senior scientist at the GSSI Satellite Lab at IMG Academy in Florida. His responsibilities focus on athletic performance testing and research. Khalil received his bachelor's and master's degrees in sports and fitness management from Troy University and earned his PhD in kinesiology with a concentration in exercise physiology from Auburn University in 2014. He played football at the collegiate level and prior to working at GSSI, Khalil worked as an adjunct professor in the School of Kinesiology at Auburn. He continues to educate and translate the science of exercise and performance to a variety of audiences. Kevin is an associate principal Principal Scientist at the GSSI Satellite Lab at IMG Academy in Florida. He leads the GSSI Athlete Service Team and assists with athlete performance testing at GSSI IMGA. Kevin earned his Bachelor's in Nutrition Science and Dietetics at the University of Nebraska while also playing football as a defensive lineman for the Cornhuskers. He completed his dietetic internship at Baptist Health Systems in San Antonio, Texas, and went on to earn his master's in applied exercise science from Concordia University, Chicago. Kevin worked as the team sports dietitian and assistant strength coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for nine seasons and served as one of the senior leaders for the NFL RD. It is with great pleasure that we present to you Khalil and Kevin. Thank you for joining us uh, on our presentation in our webinar uh, on um, From High School to the Pros, Fueling Performance in the Age of Fast Food, Skip Meals, and Convenience Stores. My name is Kevin Lures. I am a registered dietitian and sports scientist for the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Just a little bit about myself. Uh, is that my background is that I've worked in the NFL uh, for about nine years um, and I'm, I'm fairly new to the Gatorade Sports Science Institute in which I conduct a lot of different types of services for, for athletes and, and for practitioners around the country, one of them being sweat testing. And so today uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about some of the things that you can do as practitioners to help your athletes with different hurdles and obstacles that we're going to go through here in a little bit. Uh, my name is Khalil Lee, um, co-presenter for this talk today, and pleasure to, to be able to present with you all. And uh, similar to Kevin, um, you know, I'm one of the other senior scientists uh, with the Gatorade Sports Science Institute based at the uh, Bradenton, Florida lab on the campus of IMG Academy. And uh, really what, you know, we both, Kevin and I, have the opportunity to do is to work with a, a number of different athletes across different sports as well as uh, different uh, levels from high school to the elite. And so, uh, again, 
uh, our headquarters or where our lab is located is in Bradenton, Florida at the campus of IMG Academy. Some of you all may be familiar, um, but if you're not, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a boarding school as well as a training site for uh, over a thousand uh, adolescent student athletes. So uh, athletes from all across the globe come here to go to school as well as to train. Uh, there are eight sports that are housed on the campus and um, so, you know, with some of the experiences that we've been able to gain, um, you know, we hope that we can provide insight, as Kevin mentioned, that will be able to help each of you in your respective environments, whether you are working on the professional level. And, you know, we know that some of you all may be working on the collegiate level or on the high school level. Um, you know, it's, we're definitely go going to, to bring about just kind of a, a well-rounded view to touch all of these areas that hopefully you all can uh, take something back with uh, your athletes and in the, your respective environments. So uh, we hope to be able to touch up on um, a, a few things in, in, uh, throughout this presentation. And some of our objectives are to first uh, kind of get into some of the nutrition principles, um, either first of all, intro to uh, you to them or just um, just kind of recall them for, for some of those who are uh, fairly versed in, in, in nutrition. Uh, the second one is to uh, identify uh, the barriers or the hurdles uh, across different levels of athletics from professional to college to high school uh, that could warrant uh, fast or convenient foods or, or even athletes skipping meals and snacks. And then lastly, we hope to be able to implement practical approaches um, and, and help you implement practical approaches uh, to help those athletes fuel properly while, while overcoming these challenges, while overcoming these barriers and, and hurdles. And so to kind of get into it a little bit, um, uh, this, is a, this is a hierarchy of um, the, the nutrition principles and categories of nutrition, uh, starting from the bottom being your foundation and going up to the top of the pyramid. Um, and so uh, sp specifically, um, you know, the athlete should accomplish the bottom before they get to the next tier. Um, so for instance, uh, energy and hydration, you know, we're talking about calories and, and fluids, overall foods and fluids. What are you doing from that perspective? And then on the next tier with uh, food balance and food vari variation, are you, are you uh, consuming all the food groups? Um, are you varying your diet? Um, just because you're eating healthy, you know, you don't want to make sure you, you want to make sure you're not eating the same thing every day because uh, that is essentially unhealthy. Um, next is, is nutrient timing, uh, before, during, and after. So how are you fueling before? Um, how are you maintaining proper uh, fuel storages during? And how are you recovering afterward? And then lastly um, is supplements, uh, which is you know, a, a very popular topic, um, I think, uh, across all stages with, with athletes uh, from high school all the way to the pros. And just to make sure that we're uh, you know, we're focusing on food and we have a whole food approach and keep uh, in, in making sure that supplements are doing just that. They're supplement, uh, supplementing our diet and, and not replacing. And so the next, this slide uh, gets into a little bit more of the topic of nutrient timing, like I mentioned before. Um, and we're focused on three things, uh, fluids, carbohydrates, and, and protein. Um, and uh, from a fluid standpoint, um, this can, and, and all of these categories are uh, pertaining to athletes in general. And fluid uh, specifically, you know, um, consuming uh, five to seven milliliters uh, per kilogram of body weight four hours before. And then if the athlete is, um, if the athlete has dark urine color, then two hours before activity, consuming additional an additional three to five milliliters per kilogram, uh, per kilogram of body weight uh, before. And then during training and competition, um, we're actually going to make recommendations uh, based off of if they've had a sweat test done. Uh, so we can, we can 
actually capture what their sweat rate and what their sweat sodium uh, profiles look like. And then after training is, is more based on, um, on body weight changes. So uh, for every pound lost um, of body weight, is gonna, the athlete is going to want to consume 20 to 24 ounces of fluid. And then going on, shifting uh, gears to the carbohydrates, again, about one to four hours out, outside of activity, before activity, we want to make sure and consume about one to four grams per kilogram of body weight of carbohydrate, whether that be um, coming from fruits, uh, starches, such as pastas, uh, rice, bread, cereals, uh, those sorts of things, uh, and making sure that we are getting the glycogen that we need in, in, into these athletes' uh, muscles, uh, as well as liver glycogen. Uh, the, other, the other thing is uh, during training and competition uh, that's lasting over one hour, we want to make, sh- uh, make sure that, that we're consuming 10 to 60 grams per hour, um, and this depends upon intensity. Obviously, if it's, it's, a, if it's a lower intensity, uh, then we're going to go the lower en- end of the range. If it's higher intensity or if it's competition, uh, then we're going to go to the higher end. Um, and then throughout the day, and this kind of goes along with, with protein as well, um, uh, we want to make sure our athletes are getting anywhere from five to seven. It could be even, even more for endurance athletes, uh, five to seven grams of, of, uh, per kilogram of body weight of carbohydrate um, on top of what we talked about before. So this, this should actually be pretty steady throughout the week uh, because our athletes are burning carbohydrate as fuel uh, on the field or, or, or on the court. And then the last, uh, the last uh, portion we're going to talk about is protein. And, and uh, the, the, the thing I want to um, emphasize most is that um, and the, the easiest thing for athletes uh, and for you to emphasize to athletes what they can do from a recovery standpoint is c- to consume protein immediately after training or competition in the amounts of about uh, 0.25 to 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight to, uh, to help with their recovery, to get it started quickly. And uh, it's something very easy that they, that they can do. And then throughout the day, um, consuming about 1.5 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein, things coming from more uh, from higher um, quality proteins, animal products, uh, such as uh, poultry, uh, lean beef or, or pork, seafood, um, and, as well as dairy. And then you can also consume from um, uh, a mixture of uh, vegetable or plant products to uh, be able to accomplish uh, more of a, not, not, it will accomplish a higher source or a higher quality protein, but what we call a complementary protein. However, there are some um, potential hurdles uh, that, that we're going to come across. And we mentioned this in our intro. And the, the first hurdle is that, you know, we don't have, sometimes we don't have the resources that we need uh, in order to uh, be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish, whether it be uh, from a nutrition standpoint, from, the, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, uh, from, from a recovery or, or training standpoint. Um, and so depending upon the level of competition that you're at or the, the, level, the level of sport, you may have more uh, resources and, and more su- support staff than, than a different level. And so this, this, again, this is very, very important from, uh, from an education, education standpoint, as well as um, access uh, to foods. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to be primarily focused on in, uh, in this presentation is trying to make foods more accessible to athletes and what that looks like from a professional standpoint, uh, co- uh, a collegiate standpoint, and high school standpoint. And then budgets. We all have, we all have different um, budgets, no matter what level you're at or what department you're in. Um, and so that can be uh, a huge challenge uh, for those at, at lower levels of competition. And we'll get into that as well. Time. Uh, we never have enough time. And, and so uh, time is, is, is of the essence. But uh, that is a, a definite uh, challenge for, for a lot of athletes because they have to balance a lot. 
uh, at different levels. And, and that looks different, you know, from family, friends, social lives, school, um, cl in, in classes and having, having to, um, you know, travel uh, across uh, campus or e even um, the next point is travel in general. And that, and that, uh, that can be a huge challenge in and of itself. Not only does it take up a lot of time, but now you have uh, just another hurdle um, it, that will get in the way of uh, practicing uh, good uh, nutrition and access to healthy meals and snacks. And so there are some uh, common trends that, that we're seeing with, with all athletes. First one is, is going to be fast food. Uh, it, it's the most convenient in terms of uh, getting a getting a meal in, you know, um, healthy or not. Uh, I'm hungry. I just I just need to eat. And so, typically, a lot of the fast food places are going to be are going to have foods that uh, us as practitioners are not going to necessarily recommend. But I think you and Khalil will get into this in a little bit. But we are starting to kind of see a shift in fast food places and what they offer. Eating on the go, you know, going back to convenient convenient foods. Uh, it, it's, it's something that's, it's, it, now it's, it's real for everybody. It's not just athletes, but for, for um, anyone that is in the, uh, the working world, you know, everything is quick. Everything is on the go. Uh, like I said uh, before, time is of the essence and, and, and we, we never seem to have enough time uh, to get in a quick meal or a quick snack. And that's why then the next thing is the common trend is to just skip meals or skip, uh, skip snacks. Uh, because we just don't have we don't have the time, or we don't um, we don't have the the, the money uh, to to be able to afford some of those convenient foods, and so those uh, those are uh, these are all some of the the common trends that that we're seeing now in uh, in today's athletes. Yes, and just to expound more on these trends, and as Kevin was saying. You know, these trends are prevalent in all facets of society, um, just within, you know, the normal civilian world as it is, right? Uh, all of us, uh, to some degree, engage within at least one of those trends ourselves, whether it's eating out or, or you know, having convenience foods or hopefully not, but, uh, you know, even skipping meals might result. And there's even uh, data that, you know, kind of supports uh, these trends. And even from this report that was done in 2018, uh, this is a report that came from the CDC and, and they basically looked at the trends of fast food consumption among, amongst adults in the U.S. from 2013 to 2016. And what they found was that almost 37% of adults uh, were consuming fast food on any given day. Um, and so this is, you know, over a third of adults in America. When it comes to snacking, uh, snacking is actually a trend that's really been on the rise in, in recent years, especially uh, there's some data that was collected by Melendez International um, looking at the state of snacking in, in today's uh, world and economy and what they found from uh, this, this data that they collected was that 59% of adults as well as 70% of millennials prefer snacking more than eating large meals. And again, as Kevin mentioned, we are in, a, in a, an age right now where, you know, time seems to really uh, be, you know, such a, <laughs> such a, uh, a, a scarce resource. Um, schedules becoming busier and busier. And you know, seeing that this does uh, affect us in every aspect of life and in every industry, it most certainly has much play when you think about how it affects our athletes and the athletes that you're working with. And just want to say up front that we know that uh, a number of these things and a lot of the content that we'll cover in this talk, um, you know, we're currently in the middle of a pandemic and we want to acknowledge that. And so, you know, we just want to to, to mention that a number of the things that we'll speak on within this talk uh, will obviously will, will you'll have to adjust and really take into account how does the pandemic and those guidelines play into this. But we just really want to give you all a, a very much a broad perspective as to, you know, the practices that you can implement regarding these current trends that you see 
um, within even within athletics. And so just on that note, in terms of convenience foods, I think it's important that we acknowledge that convenience foods have evolved. Um, convenience foods don't really look the same today as they once did. And so even when you think about something in terms of, of what snacks used to look like, well, you know, back maybe you think 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even a snack was oftentimes considered to be something like a candy bar or, you know, a bag of potato chips, options that we might not consider, quote unquote, as, as the most healthy of, of choices. Um, and, you know, I can think back to when I was in high school. I mean, these were, you know, certainly is still some of the snacks that we were more so going towards. But now you have such a, a, a higher, uh, wider range of availability when it comes to snacks. And, and a lot of these snacks are ones that, you know, we would consider more wholesome, uh, more nutrient dense. Uh, I mean, who would have thought that, you know, today you would, one day you would be able to have kale chips. Like, you know, it, 30 years ago, I'm sure none of us thought that kale chips would be a, a big thing that, that people would have access to. But yeah, so many, uh, so many more options when it comes to snacking and now healthy snacking that makes this uh, something that we can actually leverage even with, with our athletes. Same thing when it comes to fast food, you know, fast food was once thought of as your typical burger and fries in which these options do still exist. But, you know, now you have so many more options, even, you know, you, you have what's called now the fast casual movement, where you have uh, certain, certain food change, chains that offer, uh, you know, are striving to offer a healthier, more nutrient dense, more wholesome options for people. I mean, you think of uh, a number of your different, you know, chains where you, you can build a bowl, you can tell uh, the, the servers what it specifically you want. And even thinking of how this trend has affected the kind of the more mainstream fast food industry, even some of your more traditional mainstream fast food chains, the burger and fry type of chains are now having to adjust uh, in order to this this environment where everyone is trying to be healthier, um, offering options more nutrient dense. So now these different chains are having to put salads on their menus and things of the like. And so this is just an article uh, which confirms that, you know, Taco Bell, this was released in 2015, they launched a certified vegetarian menu. Um, so this just goes to show you how some of the traditional fast food chains have even had to adjust within this environment. And I think when we think about this in terms of your athletes and the athletes that we work with, um, to know that, you know, just because convenience foods are, are very much a thing, you know, it, it's not as, as though there are, I guess, uh, options that are so limited to where, you know, it's going to be difficult to make sure your athletes are fueled or hydrated properly. Now it's a matter of seeing, okay, how can you best leverage the options that are available, knowing that there are so many more available and to help guide your athletes in the right place. So going back to these hurdles, we mentioned them. And so, you know, as we think about these things, um, here come, you know, the, the statements that a lot of you may even be dealing with depending on where you currently are. So, you know, oftentimes the, the issues that we may deal with or that you may deal with as a practitioner might include things like, you know, our athletics program is on a tight budget. Um, so, you know, it's hard, not sure, not really sure how to make sure our athletes uh, get the right fuel since we're on a tight budget or, you know, our athletes have very busy schedules or, you know, not sure what to feed our athletes on the road. So we're traveling so much. What is it that we need to feed our athletes? Or maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know, I want to make sure our athletes choose helping, healthy, healthy fueling and recovery options. And so the question that you really have to ask yourself and what we're going to get more into is despite these potential obstacles and hurdles, what practical approaches can you implement as a practitioner, whether you are an RD or, you know, maybe you're an athletic trainer and you're listening to this or your strength coach or um, whatever your role is, 
knowing that there are practical approaches that can be, be implemented. And so how can you work around these obstacles to leverage the resources around you? And so that's what we're going to get into now, talking about that on each level of sport. So to begin with, uh, we're going to start off uh, talking about the professional level. So uh, this level is usually, uh, you consider this a level being the most ideal situation with, the, with regards to optimizing sports performance and recovery. Um, so with regards to nutrition, it's more li likely that the uh, professional athlete will be able to put the basic nutrition principles that we talked about uh, and the recommendations into practice, since a lot of the hurdles and, and the challenges that, that, we, that we had talked about um, and that are prevalent within the, the collegiate and high school level are actually minimized uh, to a severe degree, um, or they don't even exist at all at the professional level. So uh, there may be actually more benefits and, and luxuries within the pro setting uh, that, that we're going to talk about. Uh, so in saying this, uh, even certain pro athletes may face uh, more challenges than others. All right. Not, not, every, not every league or not every sport is created equal. Uh, for instance, uh, minor leagues, farm leagues, or other alternative uh, professional leagues may not have the same access to uh, certain amenities as the, uh, the, the top tier leagues uh, within the sport. Uh, examples of this may be minor league baseball, uh, G League basketball, uh, or uh, the XFL. Uh, even furthermore, um, the top tier leagues uh, of a particular sport may not have the same luxuries as other sports. Uh, examples of this are Major League Soccer, NHL, uh, or the WNBA. Also, individual sport athletes, such as those in golf, tennis, cycling, and, and running, among others, uh, may experience more challenges than team sport athletes uh, within the professional realm. Uh, so there may be more hurdles than, than we think um, uh, within the professional sports realm. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, we will paint a picture of the most ideal setting within the professional sports level. So let's, let's first take a look at an example of a schedule for a professional athlete. In this case, uh, a pro football player. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, schedules will, will vary from sport to sport and team to team. However, uh, a pro athlete schedule for a year will be centered around the season with the other parts of the year being primarily focused on off-season training uh, and rest periods or breaks. In this schedule um, that you see here, a, a professional football player, um, it's, uh, um, excuse me, in a schedule here, uh, there's, there's about 22 to 27 weeks dedicated to training camp, regular season, and postseason with the other 25 to 30 weeks uh, being the off season. Uh, so the week schedule that you see here uh, is representative of a typical in-season week, uh, which is centered and planned around, obviously, the, the game day, which, which could be a Sunday game day. It could be a, uh, also a Thursday game, door, game day or even a Monday night game. But, but um, we're going to focus on the Sunday game day here. Um, the, the, uh, the day schedule here is representative of a heavy practice day, uh, which usually takes place on uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, again, uh, pro athletes' schedules will vary. Um, overall, it's important to know the schedule of any athlete at any level from, from both a micro and a, uh, excuse me, a, a macro and a micro perspective and ask yourself these questions. What are the day's demands and goals? Uh, when can we plan to consume uh, meals or snacks or even hydrate and how can we properly execute this plan and this will enable the practitioner to tailor and strategically plan uh, and place meals snacks and fluids during certain times uh, to help meet the daily demands and goals of of the athlete with regards to resources uh, the professional athlete is surrounded surrounded by uh, support staff and health professionals uh, that specialize 
in specific areas to help the athlete optimize performance and recovery. Typically, uh, these athletes will have a medical team made up of uh, orthopedics, um, doctors that specialize in other areas such as dentists, um, optometrists, uh, among others, um, athletic trainers, uh, strength coaches. Uh, sometimes uh, they have full-time or even a part-time consultant, uh, sports psychologist. Uh, more teams are starting to um, hire full-time sports scientists, um, even sleep specialists. And then in particular, a registered sports dietitian nutritionist uh, uh, with, uh, with a possible culinary staff. So overall, uh, part of the luxury of being a professional athlete is, is having uh, multiple resources uh, at, at their fingertips. So in addition to having um, all of these health professionals uh, to look to, athletes have access to luxurious training facilities that may be solely dedicated to one team or uh, to many athletes of different sports. Uh, these training facilities pretty much have everything, I mean, everything the athlete needs uh, and are off, often like, like second homes. Um, as part of the, the professional athlete's training, uh, food is, is very, very convenient. For instance, uh, training tables are most likely provided in some capacity that can include buffets uh, and action stations provided in-house or by vendors that prepare ready to eat and made to order food items that the athlete can either dine in or they can grab and go. Uh, many training tables uh, serve breakfast, lunch, uh, and dinner during the season and then they may even serve these meals in the off season. Uh, snack areas are also very prevalent and available for fueling uh, the athlete during downtimes uh, of the day, such as during meetings, uh, film sessions, and can also be pre-prepared for grab and go if, if quick snacks uh, are needed. It is especially um, advantageous to have these snack areas available for, for pre-fueling and refueling and recovery uh, nutrition items that are set up on the way to and from uh, practice or training sessions. And overall, most if not all meals and snacks can be considered convenience foods uh, for pro athletes since healthy foods are made available, uh, ready to eat for the athlete during all hours of the day, um, thus diminishing the likelihood of skipping meals or the need for fast food or, or other convenience foods before, during, and after training. So uh, moving on, uh, so time is probably at the center of, of why athletes might skip meals uh, or rely on fast food or convenience foods. Uh, however, for, for the professional athlete, time might not be as much of an issue as, as it is for the collegiate or high school athlete um, uh, as, a, uh, as a hurdle for, for practicing good nutrition. Uh, one of the luxuries of being a professional athlete is, is, is not having school in the mix, let's be honest. Uh, this means no homework, no exams, no projects, as well as, as needing to make grades to stay eligible. In addition, because of a centralized training facility location, there is, there is no need to commute to different locations throughout the day as you would with, with, uh, with classes and campuses. So having a focus on one sport is also an advantage within the professional realm, which may not be the case in high school and even in the collegiate setting, depending upon the athlete. Therefore, the athlete's able to uh, take advantage of an off season to recover and progress in, in areas uh, such as strength, size, body composition, versus constantly being in season in multiple sports. Um, and then the, the support staffs mentioned earlier can take out the guesswork with planning the workouts, treatment, as well as the meals and snacks. Again, having a sports RD um, will, with a culinary staff to, to, to prepare and cook the meals and snacks creates time uh, efficiency, thereby making it more convenient for, for, uh, for athletes. Uh, so this will, will make it less likely that the athlete will skip meals, uh, go through the drive-through uh, of a fast food place, or reach for a uh, candy bar or soda. So in mentioning all of these luxuries, uh, a challenge for the professional athlete may be balancing the family, uh, community, or other extracurricular activities. Um, obviously, 
uh, time needs to be devoted to spouses and kids that most likely take the athlete's focus away from fueling and recovery. Uh, also, uh, many pro athletes are, are heavily involved in, in community service, which is a, a great thing. Uh, therefore, uh, meal planning on the athlete's part may be necessary. Uh, however, families may also create an extra benefit if their spouses are able to, to meal plan, prep, uh, and cook for their partners and, uh, and support staff members uh, such as, as sports RDs are usually looped in uh, into any community events that demand a large investment of time to, uh, to provide travel packs of snacks and beverages. Aside from time, uh, budget might, be, uh, might also be a huge factor on why athletes rely on fast or convenient foods uh, or that they skip meals. It's no secret and, and, can be, and can be assumed that professional athletes, for the most part, make a lot of money, uh, whether they do, uh, whether it do, be due to large salaries uh, from contracts or, or even large endorsement deals. Uh, these, these can range from hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, if not millions or, or even tens of millions of dollars. Uh, because, of this, because of this wealth and this luxury, professional athletes do not need to be as strict and as careful in grocery shopping on a budget. Um, and this means that there may be more options for professional athletes since they, since they can afford more expensive foods and, and food products that may come from more expensive or higher end grocery stores. An example of this would be buying organic produce, uh, which is often more expensive than, than non-organic. As mentioned before, uh, because of the training facilities furnished with, with, uh, uh, with training tables and snack areas, professional athletes may, may have more access to food uh, funded by, by clubs or organizations. So ironically, uh, even though these athletes make more money than, than they ever have, uh, now they have access to, uh, to essentially free food. Um, however, they still might not make the best nutrition choices. For example, they, they may want to go out to their favorite restaurants and fast food places more often since, since they can afford it, uh, which may not present the best options for them, obviously. And in addition, and especially for, uh, for farm league or individual sport athletes, a personal chef uh, or, or even a, a, a sports RD uh, that, that may also even be a chef, uh, may be more affordable to come into the home to plan and prepare some or, or all of their meals and snacks for the day. Um, but overall, another area that, that, that may be a challenge or hurdle at the collegiate and high school levels is not necessarily uh, challenging for, for the pro athlete uh, because of, of, of the wealth that they, that they do gain from it. All right. So um, the 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 next uh, the next hurdle that there, that we're going to talk about is uh, is travel, um, which could be an obstacle that is that is common common amongst pro athletes, especially that uh, the ones that are traveling long long distances. However, uh, nutrition for away game competition is made a whole lot easier for professional athletes, um, for team sport athletes especially. Meals, uh, meals and snacks are planned by the sports RD. Um, that, is, uh, that is becoming more prevalent on, on the professional level um, as being more of a, a full-time uh, position. And provided, and these, uh, these sports RDs plan the menus and they provide meals on charter flights or buses uh, and, and even at the hotels. Uh, also, um, even at the venue, uh, food is made available in the locker rooms before games uh, um, and during halftime uh, on benches as well as after competition uh, when food is catered in for the, the, the post-game meal. For some teams going hungry um, on these trips, it's, it's almost impossible. However, uh, one challenge is, is when athletes spend their um, per diem, it's money that they get from their organizations, uh, that, that, that they can go out on these um, in these away cities and and spend on you know fast food places and restaurants instead of taking advantage of the food and meals planned and provided by by the sports RD. So that that could be a challenge. So professional athletes may may actually uh, have more time to grocery shop and cook on their own. However, uh, this may also be a a hurdle because they may not know how to cook 
or have someone in the household who's, who's cooking for them. Also during, uh, during certain parts of the year um, or during certain meals, training tables may be shut down or during the season, time may be more limited. Lastly, a more recognizable pro uh, professional athlete or a, a celebrity athlete may not want to attract ten attention in the grocery store, uh, causing even more time and stress uh, of signing autographs. So therefore, these athletes can, can not only take advantage of, of personal uh, chefs, as, as we've mentioned before, uh, but uh, you also have healthy meal uh, delivery companies um, that, are, that are a very good alternative since there are many companies that are devoted to healthy meals with many options for different needs. Depending upon the company, this option will uh, more likely be a, a little bit more expensive since the athlete is paying for food, labor, and, and even delivery costs. In addition, uh, another option is using grocery delivery uh, or pickup apps instead of, of having to, to go to the store. Either way, these options allow for, um, for alternatives to grocery shopping and, and cooking, which may, which may make things uh, for the professional athlete um, a, a little bit more um, conducive for, for their schedules. Um, and, um, and so they may look into these other resources. So um, with all these luxuries and, and, and some challenges, uh, so here's an example of a fueling timeline for a pro athlete uh, during the season. Um, again, uh, the professional athlete has the most ideal scenario given the resources and support staff they have access to, uh, the convenience of food, having more time and money, and um, travel nutrition is made easy uh, among a, a lot of other benefits. In looking at this um, meal timeline and, and noticing uh, all of the, the, the different um, food items, um, notice how the athletes' meals and snacks are strategically planned with, uh, with special attention to the amount of carbohydrate and protein spread throughout the day. Uh, in addition, nutrient timing is utilized with, with pre-fueling and recovery snacks. And then also pay attention to the types of foods uh, and, and food items in the menu and, and remember these when, when comparing to the, the, the collegiate and high school menu. Um, for instance, um, for breakfast, for instance, um, having three pancakes with maple syrup, a, a made to order three egg omelet with diced vegetables uh, topped with a, a quarter slice avocado, uh, strawberries, you know, th those sorts of things. Uh, I, I say it's a little bit uh, more bougie uh, in, in this environment than, uh, than it probably would be in the college or, or a high school environment. Um, and so they can have a little bit more um, uh, of a, uh, you know, foods, foods like this can be made more convenient um, uh, at this level since, again, there's a lot more support staff to, to um, help, help furnish these luxuries. So next, we're going to talk about the collegiate uh, level, which will present more, uh, some more hurdles and challenges than the pro level uh, with respect to support staff, amenities, time, budget, and travel. So like we did for the pro level, let's first look at uh, you know, a schedule for the collegiate athlete. Again, it, it's, it's important to keep in mind that the schedules will vary from sport to sport, team to team, and even school to school in this situation. Uh, but this illustration looks at a week and a day of, of a collegiate football athlete, specifically. The, the week here is representative of an in-season week, which is dictated by, instead of a Sunday game, a Saturday game, for the most part. Uh, the day is, is representative of a heavy practice day, which usually takes place on a Tuesday and a Wednesday versus a Wednesday and a Thursday. Uh, but notice a key difference in, in um, the college athlete's day um, is and, and that is that they have classes in the morning, uh, meetings after, and a practice later in the day than, than the pro athlete. Uh, also, it's a, it's a bit of a longer day, but overall, these differences uh, can create more, uh, more hurdles and more obstacles. Uh, like the pros, uh, not all collegiate athletes have the same hurdles, though. So depending upon the division, conference and sport, there may be more luxuries for some athletes, uh, yet more hurdles for others. For instance, uh, divisions two II and three, as well as uh, NAIA schools will probably not have the same resources 
amenity, amenities and, and budgets as D1 programs. Also, certain conferences and sports may experience more challenges as well. On the other hand, Division I athletes at one of the uh, Power Five conference schools, such as the SEC, ACC, Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12, uh, that play football, uh, basketball, hockey, or, or even baseball, um, will likely have most uh, or some of the luxuries as a professional. This inequality uh, may primarily be dependent on the budgets of, of each school. For Division I school athletic departments especially, there's more of a likelihood that there's a bigger pot to pull from. Athletic departments within the Power Five conferences receive hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue as well as funds from donations of past alums and boosters. Uh, therefore, budgets are, are bigger, uh, which is especially beneficial with regards to facilities as well as food and beverage for the sports nutrition, nutrition programs to feed the athletes. However, at one time, there were restrictions on how much college athletes could be fed. As a matter of fact, uh, between 1991 and 2014, athletes were only allotted one meal per day, five days per week, with snacks limited to fruits, nuts, and, and even bagels. Uh, this means athletes were fed less than a quarter of, of the week's meals. Uh, one important peach, uh, piece of legislation uh, was the NCAA Division I deregulation of feeding uh, that took place in 2014. This legislation uh, lifted meal restrictions on all 345 Division I schools, which allowed a shift from certain student athletes being fed to all student athletes being fed. Uh, and this left this lift uh, led to more training tables, and as a result, uh, there was a massive hiring of sports RDs by colleges and, and universities to control the food supply. So, therefore, uh, budgets uh, for these schools rose astronomically. Uh, and of the 23 schools surveyed, uh, budgets rose from an average of 535,000 to an average of 1.3 million dollars. So not only do collegiate athletes at the division one level have access to um, many health, practi health practitioners and support staff members, but they also ha have access to multiple sports RDs uh, with sport, even sports nutrition staffs. This may be, uh, may be even more beneficial for the athlete than at the professional level since there's more access to consult with these sports RDs, not only, but not, not only this, but, but sports RDs are better able to, to uh, divide and conquer, so to speak, to, to feed the athletes as well as provide education on why and, and, and how to, to properly fuel their bodies. In fact, having more access to the sports R, RDs has, has been proven to be more beneficial to the collegiate athlete when it comes to healthy eating behaviors, particularly as it pertains to, to fast food. A 2016 uh, uh, JI, JISSN article looked at the effect that sports RDs have on the dietary habits of collegiate athletes. And uh, based on a survey of 383 Division I collegiate athletes, they were more likely to have school provided meals and less likely to have fast food when relying on an RD as their primary source for, for nutrition information. Therefore, if you, if you don't have a sports RD in some capacity, look into it uh, immediately. Like, like is the case for uh, support staff, collegiate athletes may or they may not have access to uh, luxurious training facilities that have training tables and snack stations which alone make food very convenient, like we talked about in the professional setting. Many training tables serve breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, all year round, since these training tables serve multiple sports at one time. Also, there may be uh, multiple snack stations set, set up around campus for fueling the athletes during the day, especially during when the athletes are attending classes. Um, often these snack areas provide a plethora of pre-prepared and grab-and-go convenience foods for the athlete to take with them on the way 
during or on the way back from class. It's especially advantageous for, uh, to have these snack areas available for pre-fueling and refueling or recovery nutrition items uh, that are set up on the way to and from practices and training. Again, um, this may not be available to other collegiate athletes in, in lower divisions or, or different conferences. Uh, so these convenience foods may not be available. Uh, and so fast food or skipping meals may be more appealing, uh, be a more appealing option. Unlike the, the, the pro athlete, the, the collegiate athlete may have a more strenuous schedule. This is, this is uh, due mostly because these athletes are student athletes and have to balance the challenges of homework, exams, papers, and projects. Also, uh, extra time is taken to commute to classes on campus, and they may have meetings with professors, TAs, uh, advisors, and, and tutors. However, like, like the pro athletes, collegiate athletes are more likely involved with only one sport. Uh, therefore, the athlete is able to take advantage of an offseason to recover and to progress in such areas such as strength, size, uh, and body composition versus constantly being in season in multiple sports. However, off-seasons are more involved than in the pro level since training can last most of the off-season with, with minimal breaks. The, the, uh, the support staffs mentioned earlier are also able to help with the collegiate athletes' time since this can create efficiency with workout treatment and in, partic in particular convenience foods uh, since staff may have sports RDs, chefs, and entire culinary staff to cook, prep, uh, cook and prep meals and snacks. But again, this, this may not be available for at, at the lower divisions. And then another possible hurdle, hurdle for, collegiate af, uh, for the collegiate athlete, especially those right out of high school, is that the, the family may not be as involved like they were in high school. Therefore, the collegiate athlete will need to learn to be less dependent and may more than likely be the student athlete's first time living on, 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 uh, on their own from away from home. Like we mentioned with, with, uh, with the, the pro athletes, travel uh, is, is, is a, uh, another hurdle. Uh, college athletes um, are actually have been uh, found to, to be traveling more than in the past, um, including uh, those sports that aren't necessarily generating a, a lot of revenue. But for those teams that, that are, are traveling, that are generating a lot of revenue, uh, these sports are these. Um, are primarily determined by, uh, excuse me, the, the, the meals and snacks are primarily determined by the, the sports RD. So they're, they are creating the menus uh, for, uh, for these collegiate athletes. Or it could even be a director of ops if, if there is no sports RD. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation, again, like we were talking about before, um, uh, food is made, made uh, way more convenient uh, on the road. Um, so anywhere from charter flights to buses uh, to hotels, uh, you're going to have some sort of a meal or snack uh, provided um, while you're traveling. Uh, even again, when you get to uh, uh, where your competition is, where your, where your game is at, at the arena or the stadium, uh, the, the RDNs or, or the director of ops like we talked about before, they more oftentimes than not will have a snack set up uh, within the locker room or right outside the, the locker room, or they'll have something on the bench. Um, and then as well as, as after, um, after the games, there's going to be some sort of a, a post meal option, um, whether it be right outside the like the, the uh, locker room, or it could be provided on the, the charter flight or, or the bus. So like we did with, um, with the professional setting, we're, we're taking a look at a, uh, a day's menus uh, for a collegiate athlete. And uh, as we look at this, again, notice how everything is strategically planned. Um, we don't have the, um, we don't have the, the uh, actual schedule um, here up on this slide, but um, taking, um, taking this sort of some of the things from the, the professional meal plan and kind of copying and paste to, to this particular meal plan, kind of switch some of, of the meal items around because um, uh, that's not going to be as available for uh, the collegiate athlete as it would be for the professional athlete. 
And I want you to take a look specifically at, uh, let's say, you know, breakfast, for instance, instead of having that omelet uh, that's made to order, we're probably, you know, we're probably going to have access to more of a buffet line or buffet style of, of breakfast. And so the athlete will scoop up uh, two scoops of scrambled eggs um, and, and have uh, th three pancakes that are, that are probably sitting on the line. As well as um, for, for lunch, you know, it, it'll probably be a make your own, you know, turkey sandwich uh, on, uh, on wheat bread rather than having someone there at an action station uh, make you uh, a, a custom sandwich. Um, and they could, you know, put it on a, on a sandwich press and, and heat it up a little bit uh, and, and, uh, and, get, and, and furnish those amenities for you. And then the last thing uh, that uh, I, I want you to notice uh, is uh, sort of this, this fast casual um, idea. Um, now, I think that that's, that's sort of the, the technical term for a healthier fast food place. And I, and I know, and I won't name any names here, uh, but um, you know, burritos and burrito bowls are, are pretty uh, prevalent and um, very well liked by uh, younger individuals. And, and so I know this is definitely a, a popular option as well as a very quick option uh, for most. Um, and so uh, this is, this is a, definitely something to take advantage of. I know these, these types of restaurants are really popping up um, uh, throughout um, the nation, if, if not the world. Um, and so um, this, is, this is actually very beneficial for us as, as practitioners. And then I guess I said this, that was the last thing, but I will mention um, even like the evening snack can be very quick and convenient instead of, you know, having to, uh, to you know, uh, make or, or uh, cook up another uh, meal, uh, something as simple as cottage cheese is, is uh, very, very uh, beneficial as, a, as an evening uh, bedtime snack. All right. And then the, the final level that we're going to touch on uh, during this talk will be uh, just some considerations and applications for the high school level. And so um, the flow of this will kind of, you know, be uh, very much the same in terms of what you just heard from the collegiate and the professional levels. And so to start off, when it comes to high school and, and perhaps, you know, a number of you all listening or watching this uh, are working with athletes on the high school level. And so we know that the, the high school, the, the typical high school athlete schedule is, um, you know, you can kind of say, you think of your more very traditional schedule, all right? So perhaps not a ton of things uh, taking place outside of school and and practice and competition it's you know kind of a it kind of follows the same pattern uh day to day as opposed to maybe the professional and the collegiate and what you see there and then in regards to a day and uh, and again these schedules will vary depending on the sport as well as the type of the institution so you know a traditional public school is might have a different uh look and feel versus like a, a private school um, so the typical day might entail, you know, classes from, uh, you know, maybe as early as 7.30 to almost uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. And then after that, it's, that's when the athletes usually go to their practices and then practice will last maybe about two hours and then they head home uh, for the day and competition, you know, again, depending on the sport, it's probably going to take place on a Friday or a Saturday. Um, differ uh, something that you know a, a differing schedule to this is for example with img academy where we're based uh you know there that's a boarding school so they have quite a different schedule in which the athletes there go to school for half the day and they per, uh they focus on their sporting activities for the other half of the day so they might only take classes in the morning and then uh do their workouts and their practices for the rest of the day uh, similar to even what you might see in some collegiate settings. And so again, taking into account uh, what environment you're in, what type of school uh, and, and the schedule that's presented to the athletes is, is obviously key. When it comes to the support staff and resources on the high school level, uh, the staffs, and again, this will certainly depend on, on where they are, um, but the staffs are certainly a lot smaller. Um, traditionally, what you're going to see is, a, you know, a coaching staff, strength and conditioning coach, 
athletic trainer, those are usually uh, the, the big three that you're going to see. Um, and even athletic trainer is just, it's, it's still a, new, a fairly new frontier in terms of the high school level. Um, when it comes to, you know, a registered dietitian or a nutritionist, um, for the most part, you're not going to see this role on a high school sports staff. Now, again, depending on the school, if it's a private school that has the resources to uh, fund that type of position, that's clearly a different case. But the thing that we now have to think of is, is in most of these environments where you don't have an RD, how can you still ensure that uh, you have the, the knowledge and the means necessary to guide your high school athletes in the right direction regarding their fueling and hydration. And so, you know, be, be, because of the, the situation of a high school athlete, I mean, they're living under their, their parents' roof and they're going to school every day. So a lot of their uh, nutrition is provided by their parents. Um, or the school itself. So what they eat at home um, is going to play a big factor. And then from there, it's, you know, they're getting the rest of that when they go to school or when they, they go to, to lunch during school. And so in, in the moments in between the moments is very vital and very pivotal to make sure that the, the high school athlete has the access needed to those optimal fueling and hydration options, even when convenience foods are, are so prevalent. All right, budgets, obviously you're going to be the lowest on the high school level. And then again, you know, we certainly have to take into account the differences between private and public institutions. You know, most of your private institutions are going to have larger staffs and perhaps greater financial support, more on-site resources, and probably non-traditional schedules like I mentioned before versus a public institution, more than likely smaller staff, less financial support, limited on-site resources, and a more traditional uh, schedule with the kind of, you know, eight to three type of school schedule and things of that nature. But obviously these things will impact budget. The time uh, available within a high school, for high school athlete, it certainly can be a hurdle uh, for sure. Um, so the time for them to, to fuel properly uh, could be very difficult due to things like their school schedule, you know, based on the, the average start time of school for a high school athlete, uh, they're going to be starting school around 8 a.m. Some for some schools, it could be earlier than that. And then you think on top of that, they're in class for you know, upwards of, of around eight hours um, outside of their lunch break. And so when it comes to uh, fueling and hydration, uh, education definitely plays a big role here. One of the things that we've learned and, and seen even um, at the, the academy is that even those students have trouble, you know, making sure that they're getting the proper fueling and hydration that they need based on the fact that when they're in class, they might not be able to, uh, you know, have a snack break or, or have, you know, uh, time to have a beverage. So encouraging the, you know, the student athletes to make sure that they're carrying something as simple as a, a jug of water with them to and from class. Um, this is something that is also, also perhaps practiced by collegiate uh, student athletes as well, can definitely uh, play a big role. And then you see the, the prevalence of other extracurricular activities that the students may be involved in in the high school level can certainly make time uh, uh, very, very uh, difficult in terms of finding opportunities to fuel properly. And you know, because of this hurdle of time, uh, when we talk about skipping meals, this is the level where we really start to see skipping of meals uh, a little bit more prevalent. It's really in this adolescent age range and we've even seen it with the high school athletes that we've worked with and particularly breakfast. As I mentioned on the slide before, with the way that the schedule is set up for a high school athlete, they're beginning class as early as eight. And you know, based on how the, the environment and the landscape of high school sports is changing, you might have some athletes, some student athletes who have a, a 
strength and conditioning period right before they start their first class. So they might be starting even earlier than that. And so, um, you know, I know when I was in high school, skipping breakfast was I mean, it was almost like a common thing, especially for me when, you know, I had a mother who was uh, working the night shift, so she wasn't able to cook breakfast for me in the morning. And so, you know, as a practitioner, thinking of ways to make sure that you take into account whatever situation your athletes are in and, and how uh, you can help to ensure that they are guided in the right ways to make sure that they're getting the fuel that they need. Travel on the high school level is another area where we're starting to see more teams uh, traveling more, more teams are starting to compete out of state. Uh, the landscape of high school sports as a whole is looking a lot different than it did, you know, even 20 years ago where you're starting to see so many teams uh, traveling out of state to compete. And so, you know, when you think about the high school level and the meals and snacks that are provided on the road, they're often provided or determined by uh, the coaching staff or potentially the booster staff, um, which, you know, often are, are include a group of parents that are supporting the, the programs um, that are in place. And so with all of that in mind, just want to share some practical applications that you all can implement, particularly if you're working with athletes on the high school level. However, you know, I think that that some of these applications are things that even if you're working with you know, college athletes or pro athletes, and you're in a situation where you don't have the largest budgets or you don't have the most ample resources, um, here are some practical takeaways and things that can be implemented to help ensure that your, the athletes you're working with are having or, or guided in the right way to make the most of their fueling and, and hydration options available amidst uh, a lot of the convenience options that are around. And so the first is just to leverage um, cost and time efficient options from the, gro the, the local grocery store. Um, we've received questions before, even from other public high, high schools saying, you know, um, you know, we're having trouble like making sure that our athletes, or we don't really know what to give our athletes, like, you know, before the game or after the game, like, you know, what do we get them? Like, you know, this is what we're getting them currently. And Oftentimes, that's a question that comes up from coaches. And I think, you know, we shouldn't overlook just the, the simplicity of the cost and the time efficient options that you can find from the store. So those think of those easy to grab options like your fruits and vegetables, apples, bananas, um, carrot sticks. I mean, even going back to what can what snacking looks like today, we're now in an age where you can uh, they sell what like carrot and hummus packets, you know, who, who, again, so many more options that are available today that that can be provided for athletes, uh, or you think of, you know, pretzel sticks and, and hummus or some type of dip, you know, those come in and convenience packs today. Think of your, obviously, your quick yogurts, your Greek yogurts, nutrient dense bars, there are so many more of those today. And then uh, certainly can't forget, you know, uh, everyone's uh, or almost everyone's favorite uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I think this is even something worth noting because this is a trend that uh, we've even seen on the professional level. Um, this is an article some of you all might be familiar with, but uh, the NBA did a story back in 2017 on just the, the trend of so many NBA teams uh, having and making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for their players before the games. And this was something that was started by the Boston Celtics um, and, and, you know, a few of their players. And it really just became a, a widespread uh, new trend. But to think that, you know, the, the best athletes in the world were enjoying something so simply made with the most simple ingredients, right? They weren't uh, going out having, you know, some super expensive gourmet snack. No, just bread that you get from the grocery store and peanut butter and jelly. And, you know, it, it certainly kind of plays into psychologically what the players were looking for, which definitely does matter. But again, the fact that they were able to provide a, a sense of, you know, that carbohydrate um, kind of a, a top off right before a competition uh, really sh has shown to be effective in many ways. The second thing is to ensure that your athletes 
have fueling and hydration options that are available to them and also that are easily accessible. And I think we, these are two really big keys um, with athletes across all levels. Um, this is, as Kevin was mentioning, not as much the case on the professional level or maybe the collegiate level where, you know, some sports programs may have training tables or they may have snack stations um, or, you know, different hydration stations for as soon as they are completing their workout. But especially on the high school level, making sure that the, the athletes have easy access to fueling and hydration is so, so key. Um, it goes to the old, um, the, the old adage, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Or if, you know, if it's difficult for an athlete to get access to um, that beverage, you know, that sports beverage or whatever that, that recovery snack is, um, they're more than likely not going to, to maybe even, you know, fuel themselves properly if they don't have access to it. So access is very much key. So, you know, you might even do, for example, make sure that you set up a drink station or a snack station on the way between the, the field or the court to the locker room. So when the athletes go back to the locker room, they have to go past that snacking, that recovery, that hydration station. That's just one way in which you can manifest that. And then a third tip that we want to give you all is, um, and this is something that perhaps maybe some of you all have done, but it's to create a, a guide of recommended fast food restaurants um, that, you know, the athletes can take advantage of locally as well as for travel. And, you know, if, if, you are in a situation where you're not able to travel with uh, your athletes. Um, this is something that can especially be helpful for when your athletes are on the road, almost doing like a scouting report of whatever cities that the athletes are going to, and then just doing a quick search as to what restaurants are in the area, um, what restaurants and what, what restaurants contain uh, options that, you know, are go going to be, uh, wholesome and nutrient dense for the athletes to consume before or after competition. And important thing to note here is even to consider, you know, if you have any athletes with specific dietary needs or preferences, like athletes who might be vegetarian or vegan, um, you can create a list of these options as well. And this is something that you can create digitally and send to the athletes. Obviously, we live in very much a digital age where, you know, athletes and, and maybe even other staff are going to want to see something that's convenient um, in the format of, you know, uh, whether it's a, a digital guide or a text message. And so here, here's just, again, another example of a fueling timeline for um, high school athletes. And as you can see, we, you know, have adjusted this again to account for a situation, a typical high school athlete who, you know, probably is going to be eating a number of their meals at home. Um, so you can see how the breakfast changes um, from, you know, the full on omelet that you saw at the professional level to maybe just a couple, a cup of cereal with skim milk and orange juice. Um, a snack from home could include an apple and two uh, tablespoons of peanut butter. Um, a snack from the school for pre-practice. We have that in there as well as post-practice, including that chocolate milk and that uh, half a peanut butter and jelly, just like we mentioned. And then uh, again, another fast casual takeout dinner option that you saw similar to, similarly to the collegiate uh, example, and then as well as uh, an evening snack. Um, but again, I think, you know, there are so many ways to adjust the, the, the menu per se, or the recommendations for the athlete based on whatever, wh whatever level that they're on. And so just one other final tip that we want to share um, as we begin to close here is, you know, to really take advantage of education um, and just realizing just that as a practitioner, that it is one of your greatest tools um, and how beneficial this could be not only for the athletes, but also for uh, the parents. Um, and, and, you know, it could look as something as simple as, uh, for example, on the high school level, if you hold a meeting at the beginning of the the season um, with the parents present to educate them on 
some of the you know optimal fueling and, and recovering strategies for their student athletes and then maybe even providing some handouts for the parents to refer to to help them with fueling and hydrating their athletes um, same thing on the collegiate collegiate professional level on those levels you know you could do it the, more directly with the athletes but education is certainly always going to be one of your most uh, one of your greatest tools and I think uh, particularly in the current environment that we're in with the pandemic, um, obviously some of your sports might not be in session. And so the, the opportunity that you have in front of you now to really make headway in educating your athletes kind of during this downtime uh, can, can really help to make sure that once their sport is back in session that they are uh, better equipped to make the sound fueling choices with the opportunities that they have in front of them. And so just to, to recap uh, what we've covered in this talk today, um, obviously, as we mentioned, you know, convenience eating is certainly a growing trend and um, it's probably not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. Fast food is always going to be around, snacking will always be around. Um, and those, however, those options have evolved over time. And so with that in mind, um, really think about the obstacles that exist within your environment. Is it support staff? Is it budget? Is it time? Um, and really strive to make the most with the resources that you have available to you. Just because uh, convenience heating is, is a trend doesn't mean that it has to work against the athlete, but there are so many ways that you can really help to the athletes to leverage to use it in, in their favor remembering to leverage those time and cost efficient options for fueling and recovery. As we mentioned, you know, even the things that you find in the local grocery store um, can really uh, be a benefit within that. Also to make sure that your athletes have access, easy access to fueling and recovery options. Um, remember that environment is key. So remember to make sure that your environment is set up in such a way that your athletes are, are better able to uh, access those options. And also remember to make efforts to educate your athletes as well as parents on the quality and convenience food options that are available. And, and above all else, just remember that the primary goal really is the performance of the athlete. And I think sometimes we can get caught in the weeds of, of you know, trying to strategize so many things and working on, you know, so many minute details that, you know, really at the end of the day, if if the primary goal and focus is to make sure that the athletes are put in the best possible position to perform, then that's really what uh, you wanna stick to as a practitioner. All right, and so again, we just want to uh, thank you all for taking the time to, to tune in to this talk. We hope that you all have been able to uh, take away at least one thing that you can apply moving ahead with your athletes in whatever environment that you're in and you, can, you all can always uh, visit uh, the, the website, the GSSI website, that's gssiweb.org, where we have uh, tons more resources for practitioners like you. There is research available. There is what we call sports science exchange articles um, on different topics such as carbohydrate, recovery, hydration, and numerous other talks. We want to thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you again for attending. And a special thank you to Khalil, Kevin, and the Gatorade Sports Science Institute for supporting this webinar. As a final reminder, please complete the short survey and the 15 question self-test. Upon passing the self-test, you will receive your CEC certificate via email and your CEC will automatically be added to your ACSM profile. Have a great afternoon. This concludes today's webinar.